from the University of Manchester to do a Q&A about any questions you may have upcoming the UCAS deadline, which is next Wednesday, so it's the 31st of January, and you have until 6pm to apply to universities. So we're here to answer any of your questions. You can put them in the comment box, and hopefully we can answer or we will tell you where to get extra information. Hi, I'm Hugh. So let's start off by introducing ourselves. So hi, I'm Hugh. I've worked at the university for a little bit too long now, but hopefully I can answer any questions you might have about studying here or about the application process, anything like that. And I'm Isabella and I work in UK recruitment, so I go into schools and colleges with you. And I'm a recent graduate as well, so I know a bit about the student life and what it's like studying at Manchester. Cool. <laughs> So a common kind of question that we have is, do we have to apply by the deadline? Can I apply afterwards? And so sometimes um, uh, you can apply afterwards, but for very competitive courses and competitive universities, you need to make sure that you've got your application in by next Wednesday, because otherwise they may not be able to consider you. For other courses, like master's courses and things like that, you might be able to apply a little bit later on. It all depends on the application deadline. It's always worth researching particular universities and the particular courses you're looking for. But the UCAS deadline on the 31st of January for undergraduate courses is a really good one to stick to. Yeah, we also get asked at colleges a lot about what the campus is like and studying at the university, so we know a lot about that. So if anyone has any questions regarding the university, student life, student support, even career support, thinking about what you can get out of the university, then please drop them in the comments below. I won't answer them. Uh, Amina's asked, what is the accommodation like? Do you want to take this one? Great, so we, there's quite a lot of accommodation that we have at Manchester. So because we're a big university, we have 23 halls of residence, around 8,500 rooms. So it all depends on what you want, really. So um, the halls of residence are kind of vary depending if you want to, you're an undergraduate student or someone starting like a, a normal degree, or if you're a postgraduate student. So we have slightly different halls for each of those. But um, when you're applying to a graduate student or someone starting like a, a normal degree or if you're a postgraduate student so we have slightly different halls for each of those but um, when you're applying to a kind of the ones that you find the ones you prefer at the top so there are some that are really popular and oversubscribed place under a park which is down in Fowlfield but there's loads of other halls residents as well so it all depends on if you want on suites if you want catered accommodation if you want sharing bathrooms or you want to and be able to cook your own food. It really does depend on what you want. Have a look on the accommodation sites, uh, accommodation offices website on the Manchester website as well, and there'll be a lot more information about each of the rooms, the cost that's involved, the contracts, that kind of thing. Because it's all about what you want from it. I think it's also great to note that the transport in Manchester is really good. So if you are a local student and you're a commuter like I was, there's buses, trains, trams, walking, cycling routes. So. You've got a lot of options if you're not thinking that you want to stay in accommodation or if you just want to stay at home. Yeah, and there's a living at home society as well. So there are lots of societies at the university, so if you're interested in any particular hobbies, you can find a society that matches that, one of which is a living at home society to help those students who are commuting into Manchester to kind of build a sense of community and get to know other people who might be on the same train or same tram as you. So we've had a couple questions around like courses specifically. So Ali's asked about whether they can get into maths with CCD. Uh, and somebody else has asked that they've applied for an MSc and they have accepted unconditional. Do they still have to go through UCAS? Okay, great stuff. So let's start off with specific questions. We'll try our best, we'll try and answer some stuff, but our admissions teams are the font of all knowledge when it comes to our things about information about courses. So for something like maths, the typical requirements for our undergraduate courses will be something like the normal ones will be around A star AA, and we have contextual offers as well, which is slightly lower, so that will be around three A's. So it probably means that that probably wouldn't be likely, unfortunately, with maybe those predicted grades. Um, but if you've got any questions about your eligibility for a particular course, the best thing to do would be to have a look at uh, the course pages themselves and then there's an email address for any of the admissions teams. We'll try and help if we can, but any really specific questions they're able to help you with. Um, what was the second question? My memory is terrible. About MS? Oh yes, sorry. Um, in terms of uh, if you're applying for a Masters, if you're doing a standalone Masters, then no, you wouldn't need to apply for UCAS. If it's an integrated master's, so a course uh, on our web pages that comes up under undergraduate, some of them are like MNGs, some of them are MSCs, they, you will need to apply for UCAS. The majority of our postgraduate taught courses, if you find them in the postgraduate taught section of our website, no. The application process is directly to the university and they have specific deadlines depending on the course. 
So somebody's asked what the deadline is for you, Cass, so it might be a good opportunity to, to maybe reintroduce yourselves as well and say, say what we're here yeah, for. Yes, so for we're job. here, thank you, Harriet, we're here from the recruitment team at Manchester, so we talk to school students, college students about applying. So the UCAS deadline is next Wednesday, so the 31st of January, so you have until 6pm to submit your application, which will include, include your personal statement and your options, so where you want to study at university and what course you want to choose. So we have, you can ask any questions regarding the UCAS deadline, whether it be personal statements, what university you're still thinking about, if you're still considering what course to do, drop it in the comments and we'll try and advise you and give you our knowledge. <laughs> we'll try our best anyway. Yeah. So, uh, some of you may have heard us earlier, but my name's Hugh. Uh, so if you've got any questions, feel free to ask. The only stupid question is the question you don't ask, is my little, quick, little <laughs> phrase. A bit cheesy, but I enjoy it. Um, so Amin has asked, do the university offer career opportunities or placements after you've graduated? Yeah, I guess I can talk about that. So I'm a graduate intern, so I did my a training for teaching after I finished university, so in 2022, and then I returned to the university to work here, so I did a, an internship application and I got support from the university because I found the job through the university because I'm a graduate, so I got support on my cover letter and my CV and they can also give you interview tips so there's loads of opportunities for our career team to progress onto whether you want to go into something in your field or if you want to work at the university as a graduate intern like myself so yeah, there's definitely loads of support available all the time with our career service, they're amazing and you can, get, you can engage with them up to two years after you graduate as well. And you can do it all the way through your degree. So the big trick that people, students miss, is they only speak to them maybe in their final year or a couple of months after about to graduate. Speak to them, maybe not day one, but early on in your degree. And that means that they can help you talk about part-time work, summer work placements, think about work opportunities and skills and networking that you can do. So I would really recommend speaking to our amazing career service early on. Make sure you make, the, make use of that all the way not just at the end. I would say as well <clears throat> that it's not just a career service who help you with careers, it's the academics as well. So you'll have an academic tutor who can advise you and often in your studies you'll have modules that are dedicated to helping you boost your career. It might be helping you identify skills that are good for the certain career that you want to go into or helping you prepare for interviews. So it's not just a career service, it's also the people who will be teaching you, who will get to know you one to one in your, your seminars and your lecturers who know what your skills are and your capabilities and how you can expand on those when you're looking for jobs. So we've had a couple of questions around medicine specifically. Uh, somebody's asked, will the uni consider people with great A-levels and UCATs but don't meet the GCSE requirements for medicine? So for that particular question, I mean, it's one that you probably should check with the admissions team. What I will say with medicine is generally the GCSE requirements are pretty fixed. So they will be usually seven grade sevens at GCSE overall, and in English and maths to be two grade sixes if they're not already counting those sevens. Unfortunately, because of how competitive the course is, usually there aren't too many opportunities to relax those requirements unfortunately but if there's any particular reasons why you might not have done so well or one of the subjects is perhaps a little bit lower I would def definitely recommend speaking to the admissions team it's ug.medicine at manchester.ac.uk but you can find that email address on the medicine course profile if you're interested in applying for medicine more generally there's a really detailed application process guide about all the different steps including as you mentioned the UCAT so do have a look at the if you go to the course page there's like a process guide it looks like a weird little link but actually it goes to an amazing set of resources that you should really make the most of and IMSI's asked do universities look at AS grades or rather predicted A level grades um, so, does my have to take this one? Mm -hmm. i just keep talking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, in terms of what we look at, we don't tend to use AS grades because English students don't have them anymore. So if you're from different parts of the UK, you may have AS level, some people won't. So therefore we use predicted grades for fairness. So it also means that uh, however your kind of school or college is assessing you, so you might have mock exams that your teachers might use to make those predicted grades. We don't know the individual grades you get in your, in your mocks, but we only see the predictions. And that's what we're gonna use to see how likely you are to meet our requirements and kind of what that offer would be in some cases. Uh, so I've got a question of what's your top tips around writing an amazing personal statement? Mine would be to <clears throat> explain so 
I've read a lot of personal statements since I've been doing this role and people tend to put something that they've done that's amazing, so an experience or maybe a job that they've done, but they've just stated it, they've not gave like more detail and they've not told us how it's helped them maybe develop confidence or build as a person or teamwork, they're just stating that they've done something but they've actually not gone into depth. And what we like to see is somebody who's explained what they've actually done and told us a bit about how they've done it, how it's helped them as a person and how they think it's going to help them on the course. So definitely just detail things, don't just state something without actually explaining it and making it relevant to the course. Absolutely, I agree entirely with that. The other thing I'll say, and this will sound a little bit weird, is I should be able to tell from your first paragraph what you're applying for and why. That sounds really weird, is I should be able to tell from your first paragraph what you're applying for and why. That sounds really like really general and really obvious, but actually I've seen many personal statements where that's not the case. Get someone else to have a look at it and they should be able to tell without knowing much about you, your interests and your kind of motivations and kind of why this is the right choice for you. Because we're using it to assess candidates that kind of meet our requirements from a admissions perspective, but also that will want to and have the drive to succeed on that course. So in the opening paragraph it should really make it clear what subject you're going for and the reason and motivation for that. So we've had a few questions around about wiggle room where one person said that the requirements are AAA for their course but they have A star AB, would that still be a consideration? I would, um, it, again, I'm sorry to say it might depend, it's almost my favourite answer for every question, but in this case I probably would apply in that circumstance. Um, it really does depend on the course as to how flexible they can be and it does vary between each department at the university and in universities more generally. But um, if that is the kind of circumstance I would apply, I might contact the admissions team first just to double check to make sure that you're not wasting a choice, but for the majority of our courses uh, for, and that kind of combination, I would, I would say go for it, see what happens. What I will say is that we would make the standard offer, so the offer will be the same for all students, so with the free A's for example, and if for example you did get that B in the end, then we would have to look at that point to see whether we could accept that. So again, that wiggle room is both at the uh, kind of initial application, but also when you get your results. And we don't know if we will be able to be flexible until we see who gets their results. Because we're waiting, we make more offers than we have places, which is naturally the case when you're applying to up to five choices, and therefore we're just waiting to see how many people pick us as their firm choice, and how many people actually get the results. So they're the kind of things that will determine how flexible we can be later on. Yeah, thanks for bringing in all your questions. Uh, do leave any comments in there and we'll get back to you as quickly as we can, just rattling through as many as we can. Um, so another question that we have is, is it possible to change your course after you've already applied? Can we just keep going? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the experience, more experienced than I am still? Be certain never, questions be never that too long. I'll be better answering. I think she's calling you old then. <laughs> uh, I remember I can answer relevant student life ones. Yeah, as so, you can. So please ask something about being alive as a student as well. It's about like, yes, yeah. okay. Um, so was this changing course after you begin or changing course after you applied? Uh, after you've applied is the question, but after you begin it'd be good to I'll do well. I'll do a little bit of both then. So it's no, I can't say that. It, it varies. It depends. Um, it, it depends. But no, it's generally generally possible to change things. It's it, it's the answer depends on when you're making that change. If you're making it very soon after applying, you can speak to UCAS about uh, alternating your changes. So you've got like a like a cool down period. So very much a conversation if it, if it's in the first week or so to speak to UCAS before you do anything else. If it's changing courses within the university, so let's say you've applied to politics at Manchester, but actually you want to change your application to politics and history, then it's worth speaking to the admissions team. So contacting the email address for politics and history, seeing would I be able to be considered for that course, and they will be able to let you know. Often I've seen the case that people are able to do that, but the sooner you do that, after you make that initial decision, the better. So if you wait till like results day, then all our places will be filled and we'll have to be quite strict about it, we may not have that flexibility, but the sooner you can do that, the better. In terms of when you start at the university, um, it is sometimes possible to change. Again, this would have to be very early on. So I've known the deadline to be around two weeks in, for example, because you can't start too much teaching and have missed out on loads of stuff. So it is generally possible. I would say the more research you can do in advance of applying, the more you can understand what that university is teaching and the kind of options you can pick so that you've made the right decision, the better. Although these things happen and people change their minds, so if you do change your mind, speak to us, speak to us early on. You're better off dealing with it there and then than worrying about it and wondering if you can do it after you start.
Lovely stuff. Um, we've had a question about how international students and how their requirements might differ. So how are they different? Yeah. I'll take it. I'll just keep going. <laughs> uh, so in terms of general requirements, A-levels and whatnot, uh, or IB or other qualifications, they should be equivalent. So we ask for the same qualifications from UK students as we ask for international, and there should be an equivalence between them. So the same grades A level versus the Indian year 12 qualification, the, the proportion of students that will have each should, should match up. We also ask for both students things like English language qualifications, so UK students would be a GCSE, for international students that might be something like IELTS or IGCSEs or something equivalent, so we're asking for the same for both. The time where it varies uh, will be things like we have to be a bit more focused on getting the qualifications, we might have to prove the English language qualifications a little bit more and ask you for your IELTS test number for example, so it does vary a little bit there. Getting the qualifications, we might have to prove the English language qualifications a little bit more and ask you for your IELTS test number for example, so it does vary a little bit there. If there are in-person interviews for UK students, it might mean that there are virtual interviews uh, for some courses, but otherwise it isn't actually that much different when you first submit your application. I think See, you, you just know that we can. I know, you do. <laughs> I think you might get a little break here though for a second. <laughs> Excellent. Um, what was your favourite part of uni as a student? My favourite part, it actually links to like being international, like so we're so diverse at this university, so I've met friends from all around the world, so not just the UK, which was great for me because it, that wasn't necessarily the case when I was a student at college, but as soon as I came to the university and just how big it is and the range of different people you meet, I think that was the most amazing thing for me. So everyone has different experiences, so it's like learning about people's experiences because I'm local to Manchester, so I'm very set in my ways. And then like one of my very good friends, they, they came from Beijing, so it's like quite a good distance. So I got to learn all about his application to come into Manchester his decision why Manchester I mean it's an amazing city so I can't really blame him but it's like what stood out to you as opposed to like all the other universities of the UK as well there's like so many opportunities to do extracurricular things so as well as our societies and our clubs I went down the volunteering route so because I was interested in teaching I found volunteering through our volunteer hub to tutor local students so that was great for me to build my confidence and to build skills for my CV. So I was doing something fun to help the future me with my CV to make sure I had things on my CV. So that when I was graduating I had somewhere to go and I was, had skills that I could build upon and then take to job interviews to talk about. So it's very fun and all the social side but also there's so many ways to develop your skills with the university. Whether it's through doing volunteering which is fun or whether it's by going to the career service, so just a range of everything from the university, the, the support, the meeting new people, the experiences, there's just loads to it. And this, is why, she, you'll agree. and this is why she's got to stay, you can't, she loves Manchester Oh yes, so much. you can't get rid of it. Um, always a Manchester girl for me, so yeah. <laughs> Um, so this is from an engineering student, but I guess uh, it goes with, with many other courses as well. But somebody's asked, can engineering students travel abroad during their time studying? That's a really good question. Um, the answer is probably, I think, I can't remember. So the majority of our courses you're able to study abroad on. Other courses are a little bit more difficult because of the way that the accreditation and teaching works, so therefore it's less flexible. I do know that we have some summer schools uh, that are able to, students are able to access, so places like Denmark, for example, where if they aren't able to fit in a semester or a year abroad, you may be able to do a kind of a summer school instead. So what I would have a look is have a look at our um, like global mobility team, have a look on the study abroad options on Manchester's website, because it will talk about the non-standard ones, ones where you can't fit it into the course. Engineering, I think, is one one where it is a little bit trickier because of the way that it's taught and kind of the relationships to different universities, so I know, don't know if you'll be able to do it as part of the course itself, but there are certainly ways to kind of get your international fix and perhaps perhaps to a summer school rather than do it as a, as a structured part of your degree. There's definitely options there, but it might be not a full option like other students that maybe a humanities student would be able to do. Lovely. <laughs> Uh, somebody else asked, if I put Manchester as my insurance and got grades for my firm, could I still go back and choose Manchester? 
Tricky one. It happens all the time, so don't worry. And the fact you want to put us as your insurance choice, we're not going to be deeply offended by you, don't worry. Um, so what happens is, it's an automatic process. So what I would think of an insurance... Sorry, I should say to you, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> You're making rude now. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I apologise. If you want me to shut up, please ask us about it. Um, the way that I would think of an insurance choice is it's not a second choice. It's not like your backup. Well, it is a backup actually. It's not like I prefer one university and the second one's all the kind of the one I might want to go to afterwards. Your insurance is your backup choice. So what happens is an automatic process. If you've got the grades to meet the conditions of the offer for your firm choice, you go into your firm choice. It'll be an automatic thing. And essentially what happens in UCAS is essentially it declines us and there's nothing that it can happen. If you decide you want to um, after you've got your results, you've been placed, you think, oh, I made a mistake, I want to see what's available, you'll need to speak to us at, it's clearing there, essentially, so you'll need to see what vacancies are available. So we could see if there are opportunities to, to, for, on that course, if there's places, and therefore you can kind of come back to us. But you've kind of almost given up your place because you've gone to your firm choice. However, if it's before you've made your, got your results, so let's say you've made your firm insurance choices and it's, May time and you've still got time to decide really but you've, you've, you've regret the decision that you've made and you want to switch them. First of all, try and speak to UCAS, so if you do it early enough UCAS can switch them or amend them um, and then um, UCAS will be able to advise you what the process is. So they can quite often change them but they have to get approval from the two universities if it's a little bit later on. So if it's, so it depends on if you've got your results, it's coming back through clearing. If it's doing it early on, it's speaking to UCAS or, or them then speaking to the universities to switch, to switch those choices. So it depends on the time of year. Can you tell us a little bit about the Manchester Access Programme and then I guess just what access schemes are in general? Yeah, um, so the Manchester Access Programme is for local year 12 students, so it's a way for them to I guess build on like skills and come to the university um, to prepare them for university life. So there's a criteria that you have to meet. So on the on our website there's a really good like page full of information. So what the criteria is, what you'd get from the scheme, how you'd benefit from it. Um, I mean what I'll say though is the important thing to remember is you have to be studying or living in Greater Manchester yeah. and you also have to be near twelve. Also, the application deadline is really early, or relatively early, so it's about, it's already passed yeah, course, for students for this year. So if you haven't, if you're in, also, the application deadline is really early, or relatively early, so it's about, it's already passed yeah, course, for students for this year. So if you haven't, if you're in, um, think about applying early in the autumn, so you'll be able to apply sometimes September, October time, as Isabella mentioned, it's a great scheme to kind of build your experience mm -hmm. of higher education, have lots of events and sessions on during the year, and you'd get a, a lower offer as part of that, so it's typically two grades off. So, if you're in year, if you've just missed that deadline and you're, and or, you're um, a UK student living outside of uh, Great Manchester, we also have a distance access scheme as well. So this is something that takes place in year 13. And it's something that you don't really have to apply for, but you kind of do, because we invite you to take part in it. So we have, it depends on the course, not every course takes part, but for students that meet the eligibility criteria, we'll send them an email to say, would you like to take part in this program? You do like an academic, an academic essay with a, one of our admission, uh, one of our kind of academic tutors who will support you with that. Or if you're already doing something like the EBQ, you can use that as the, as the evidence of how the academic side of it. Again, you get grades off, again, you have like virtual stuff as part of it, but again, it's something that we would tell you about. So so there's nothing that you need to apply for. So those two are our main access schemes into the university. So MAP for local students and Year 12, very early on, or Manchester Distance Access Scheme for students from around the UK that we will target and contact you about separately. I've not heard though from any student that they regret doing the scheme, so I definitely look at it because every student I've spoken to who say they're on the schemes, they say that, you know, they've built in confidence and they're really grateful that they've done it and it's given them an insight that they wouldn't have had before and they feel really supported so we've always had really good feedback which is nice to know so definitely have a look on the website if you're interested in it. Yeah, I'm a former MAP student so I'll, I'll rep that as well. Um, we've had a few comments that say can I ask a question and uh, one that said can I ask a question about masters. Pop in any questions that you have and we'll, we'll see, how we, uh, see how we get on, see what we can do. Eh? Um, so one question that we do have is, is UCAS the only way to apply for the university? Can't I send an email, especially for scholarships? 
So, um, for undergraduate courses, you have to apply for UCAS, I'm afraid. Uh, so, anything that's an undergraduate degree, yeah, UCAS is the way that all universities in the UK manage uh, applications to them. Uh, you'll have up to five choices, and that choice can be a course or a university, but yeah, uh, it is uh, applying. As I said, you can apply after that January the 31st deadline, however, it might be that certain courses are full and that we won't be able to consider you. So don't, there are still opportunities and you can still, you'll be able to see after that date uh, what is available in UCAS so you can see what you can apply for. But yeah, um, for undergraduate courses, yeah, UCAS is the way to go. I think students sometimes feel a bit overwhelmed when they're looking at UCAS, but it's important to remember that there's so many people in the same position as you, so it's okay to feel the nerves and maybe a bit of dread with applying, but you know, if people use UCAS, I use UCAS, you use UCAS, so... It probably looks very different between the two, but yeah, it's, um, it's definitely the way that you go. You know, don't let it overwhelm you, and look online at the resources. Like we said, the application deadline is next Wednesday, so you've still got time. 31st of January so if you think that you're interested in university and there's a course that you really think you'll enjoy then definitely have a look at UCAS and consider it and don't feel overwhelmed because you're not the only one and if you do it's fine. <laughs> So again, we're getting a few questions about specific courses, which I know you won't know off the top of your head. But... Try us. Maybe you will. Okay, I'll see what courses ones we have here. About specific courses, which I know you won't know off the top of your head. But... Try us. Maybe you will. Okay, I'll see what courses ones we have here. And what are the requirements? So normally we do computer science, so we used to do separate degrees in artificial intelligence and computer and systems engineering, but we combine them all into computer science. So if you're interested in the software side of engineering, then absolutely computer science is the one to go for. It does have our highest entry requirements in the university, unfortunately, so for A-levels we're looking at three A-stars is a typical offer. Although we do use contextual admissions, so the, um, the, if we use the contextual data, the offer could instead be A-star AA, which is still hard, but it, it's definitely more achievable. And you would need to do maths and a second science, so maths and either computer science or physics. Um, what was the next question? My the memory's awful. I think that was, I think that was yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. It. I mean, it's a course that the, the grade requirements come to mind straight away because they are so high, but if you think you, you can do it then. If you're interested in the hardware side of engineering, an alternative you could think about is electrical, electronic or mechatronic engineering. So they're all about computer systems networking, robotics, that kind of thing. And that's a bit more, a little bit of programming, but much more of the hardware side of things. So it all depends on how much programming you want to be doing versus how much you want to be kitting around with stuff. And they're slightly more, uh, they're more around three A's typically for those courses. So I would say if you like that area of work, but you're not quite kind of completely focused on the programming, maybe look at one of those types of engineering as well. I can't believe that I said you might not know it off the top of your head, oh, and you've you reeled off. Day. Yeah, that was, Somebody that was impressive. Somebody needs to ask a question that's going to challenge you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Um, so one person has asked, I did a foundation year at MMU, can I join here for the first year? Um, so that will, again, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry, it does depend. So you, what you need to do is you need to contact the admissions team. Quite often we will say what foundation years we accept, but because every foundation year at every university is slightly different, they'll be able to let you know the kind of the eligibility criteria and the grades that we'll be asking for. So we accept many of them, but it's very much on a course by course basis. So have a look on the degree you're interested in going into the first year to, and uh, let, uh, we can kind of let you know if you'll be able to accept it. It's a really common question, so you can probably find a lot of the information online, but otherwise, um, if you just drop us a quick email, we should be able to let you know. They are coming in thick and fast now. Um, do you accept A-levels is hopefully a nice easy one for you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, every course has different entry requirements, so whatever course you're interested in, look on our website and when you go into the entry requirements it will tell you what A-levels we accept. Some courses need specific A-levels, so for example medicine you'll need specific A-levels, but others it can just be your A-levels will probably be okay to apply for the course. So just check online, check what grades you require and check if you actually do the A-levels that are needed for the course or not. If you're doing combinations of qualifications, so let's say A-levels and BTECs, you look under the BTEC requirements and that will tell you what you need alongside the two together. So A-levels are the most common application that we'll get, that's most what most people will have, but we also accept a whole range of different things. It's sometimes hidden away. If you go to the course profile, go to entry requirements and go to alternative entry requirements. That doesn't just do international ones, it also does UK ones as well. Lovely stuff. Uh, moving on from A-levels, uh, what about T-levels? <laughs> 
we definitely accept T-levels, but it really depends on the subject. So if you Google T-level Manchester, there's a really good page that talks about all the different pathways of T-level and the courses that each one is relevant for. So for example, the health pathway, nursing, midwifery, some of the biosciences foundation years as well. Because we need certain A-level subjects, it doesn't mean that we can accept the T-level for entry onto all of our courses. So it doesn't mean that it's everything that you're able to do, but on each of the courses that accept it, you can go into the alternative entry bit and there'll be a drop down for T-level or if you search for T-level Manchester there's one big page that's all the different pathways and what you can do with the pathway that you've taken so at least it'll be like a one-stop shop to find exactly what you're able to study at Manchester. Uh, we've had one about medicine I think we touched on earlier but it's been repeated a couple times since actually but uh, for medicine do they care about your GCSEs as much as other aspects and if so what are they? Uh, the GCSE requirements are, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> seven, uh, seven grade sevens at GCSE, English, maths, and two sciences need to be at least a six. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, uh, well, not unfortunately, it is a part of the admissions process. So, yeah, we, we do use GCSEs and we are relatively strict on them. If you're not mi narrowly missing them or if there's any reason why you haven't achieved those GCSE grades, um, then contact the uh, admissions team and they can uh, have a chat with you about your eligibility. If you're mi narrowly missing them or if there's any reason why you haven't achieved those GCSE grades, um, then contact the uh, admissions team and they can uh, have a chat with you about your eligibility uh, and to come to the UK and are doing your levels in the UK then they can have a conversation with you about what qualifications you've taken previously and we can see what the equivalent to your GCSEs might be so it's, it, that also is a situation that sometimes happens but yeah, we need the GCSEs <coughs> in the road. Cool, uh, keep your questions coming in guys pop them in the comments when you have them uh, I think Riz has asked again about whether is it economics and something else and sorry, let me get that back up whether business and economics are two separate A-levels. I think we answered that one before. We're saying that they're two yeah, separate ones, aren't we? Um, I mean, if there's any reason that that isn't the case, you can check on the course profile. Sometimes we specify certain A-levels, but in the whole, economics and business are uh, generally accounted as separate than Manchester. The same with uh, maths and further maths, which is another question that tends to be similar. Cool. And we've got a few international questions, which uh, I'll see what you, what you think of these. So one of them is, can you apply first and do IELTS later? And another one is, how do I get a good scholarship? I'll just keep going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to get a I'm about you. <laughs> Sorry, is it? Please ask questions I about student life. Um, so in terms of the English language stuff, yes, you can do IELTS, um, and you can do that uh, later on. So you don't need to have them in advance of applying, but do put it as, as a pending qualification. So in the UCAS application, you'll put what you already have. So if you've got... Uh, a certain qualification and you can put in that you've done what you've done already and that what you're currently studying so let's say um, you're studying A levels but you haven't got GCSEs then you can put that you're currently studying A levels and that you're also studying for IELTS and we'll make a conditional better offer on based on that so for example for economics it'll be something like three A's A level and 6.5 in IELTS with no lower than six in any components we can make that kind of conditional offer so you don't need to have it in advance I think he has a photographic memory of our course <laughs> website and our, yeah. well, he, <laughs> our many courses. All of this is on the website though, so please do feel free to have a look there. You requested that they ask you questions and we've had three in a row come in, oh, so gosh, you, you have a nap if you want to. <laughs> um, so the ni a nice easy one actually to start with is, what's Manchester like for students, uh, Fergus has asked. Amazing, if I was putting it simply, so there's, I mean, there's lots to do, so you've got your, your typical social life where you can go on nights out, but there's those places, you know, you don't have to necessarily drink, I think people sometimes think that going to uni involves, you know, alcohol, it doesn't, there's no pressure to go on a night out and involve alcohol, there's loads of different things you can do from our 400 clubs and societies, they can, you know, they allow you to meet new people, it might be a pub crawl, but it doesn't have to have alcohol in. It might be a film night, it might be a quiz night. So there's those to do in terms of the unit. And then if you stay in the student halls, you'll get to know people, you'll familiarise yourself with the student areas. Or the same with the students' union, you might get to know people, whether it's like playing a game of pool or just having a chat. And then we've got, I mean, as part of our university, we've got the Whitworth Art Gallery, we've got the Manchester Museum. So if you're thinking about a nice relaxing day or you might take a walk around Whitworth Park. So there's a lot to do, it depends on what you're interested in, but I would say in terms of student life, Manchester's got it all. We've got you know the second biggest Chinatown in England. So there's different there's loads of different things to do. 
whatever you've got an interest in, I'm sure you'll find it. I tend to like to go on our um, TikTok and our Instagram to see what people are posting. They post reels, it's like a day in the life of a student, so it's not always about what they're studying, it's also about what they get up to after they finish university. It might be sports related, or again, it might be to do with the clubs or societies that they're in. So, yeah, have a look on social media, that's a great way to see, like, real life students and what they're actually doing now and how they spend their time outside of studying. Speaking of social media as well, uh, somebody's asked whether we make TikToks touring the accommodation. I don't think there's any immediate plans, but I can speak to the team and see what we can get, but there's loads on the website as well around that. Um, I know we've just got some new photography on there as well, uh, which is great. But I know you did an amazing answer to this before, but somebody's asked again. If you can do it word for word, go okay. for it. But um, do you have any tips on personal statements? So I would say we were talking about our best tips before. So my best tip from experience of reading several personal statements is that people will tend to say something that they've done. So for example, they might be part of a team or they might have a job. And they'll just state it and then they won't go into detail about it. So it's all good stating it. It's really good that you've got that experience. But you need to tell us about how it's helped you as a person. So has it helped your confidence skills, your teamwork skills, and how it's relevant to your course. And I had someone once say to me, you know, they didn't have confidence in themselves and said, I only do netball as like an extracurricular thing. But I said, well, with netball comes the teamwork, it, you need confidence, you need to have like organisation to and all these skills that quite came with the netball they didn't think about it and then when I actually said you know you need to list all these skills and they had a paragraph about a skill that was relevant to the course and it was something that they enjoyed so have confidence in yourself and make sure you actually think about how to detail your experiences don't just state them actually detail them so what you did and how it helps you positively Lovely stuff. So we've got around about ten or so minutes left. Doesn't time fly? No, you have a fun. I'm learning love from the rough you. <laughs> so if you've got any more questions, do stick them in the comments box. I know we've had loads around different courses, so if you just pop that in on our website, you can see specifically around about what we offer and, and what the entry requirements are. One person's asked, is there an AI course? Is that a question you'll know to? It's part of the computer science course. So it used to be a separate degree. So we had a whole BSc in computer science. It's now part of computer science. So there's particular pathways within the degree. So you can either do a bit of everything or you can choose to focus more on AI if you wanted to. But computer science is your best bet. I bet there's an AI society. And if there's not, well, you can make one. So if sure. it's not one of our 400 clubs and societies, then <laughs> have a think about it. Were you part of any societies when you were there? I wasn't. When I, so I was saying before that I did volunteering, so I've always had an interest in education and teaching, so instead of joining a society, I did volunteering through our volunteer hub, so it was with an organisation called Action Tutoring, so it was all online, and it was tutoring year five, six and seven students, so English, that was my forte. Um, but yeah, it was really fun actually. It wasn't just, you know, all teaching and doing, having no fun, it was meeting new people and building relationships with other people and learning about different experiences. So I, I would have joined a society if I didn't do the volunteering, but to prioritise my time, because I will say I also had a part-time job, which is sometimes a common question we get, whether you can do part-time work while you're studying at university. And I would say as long as you prioritise your time, yes, you definitely can, because I had fun, I had social life, I volunteered, and I had my part-time job. So Keeping busy. Yes, I was keeping busy, making the most of it. Uh, a big congratulations to Ollie, who's just said that they got accepted on BSc Mathematics oh, with nice. Finance. Oh, Lovely. congratulations. We look forward to seeing you in September. Uh, and somebody else has asked, is dentistry hard to get into? The answer is yes, unfortunately. It is a, um, it is a competitive course. Um, it's a very popular one. And that's the reason why there's quite a few steps through your application process. So do you have a look at that process guide that I mentioned earlier. So you need a good set of GCSEs, you need to get in work experience. And we'll also ask you to complete a, a non-academic information form. So basically, can you explain why we do dentistry? Why would you come to Manchester? What teamwork examples you have? What your hobbies and interests are? And what's the other one? You said work experience? I did. Right, right. let's do it in order. Um, why Manchester, why dentistry, hobbies and interests, 
work experience, teamwork, there we go. So what examples have you got of working in a team? So have good examples for each of them. There's also an interview as part of the process, so your ability to be able to communicate effectively, work with others. The more work experience you do, although we're a little bit flexible on that now than we used to be, the better, because you do better at interviews. So I would say the more you can interact with people, the more you can explain your passions and interests, the stronger your application would be. But do have a look at the GCC and A-level requirements. I really thought for a split second we'd stumped you for the first time, but it just, just didn't quite happen. Um, so one question as well is, uh, why did you specifically choose Manchester? So I'm from Manchester, but so maybe I sound biased, but my, when, I, when I visited the university on one of our open days, which upcoming in June, so <laughs> feel free to, to participate in one, but when I, when I visited on the open day, I just felt like I've just had a feeling, I don't know what it was, I don't know if it was like the busy, fast-paced environment of it all, being near the city centre is something that I really enjoyed. And then, so I studied English language, so I had like a, a taste lecture, and I got to speak to the academics, and they, you know, they really made me feel like this is where I want to study English. And I went to other universities as well, and they were, you know, they were amazing. But there was something about Manchester, I can't quite put my finger on it. Like I said, I don't know if I'm biased, because I'm from Manchester. <laughs> But it was just more about the course itself. <laughs> um, so I looked through the course profile because every course is different at universities. So English at Manchester might be different to English somewhere else. So I did make sure that the modules were something that I was interested in. But like I said, it was also the busy nature of the university, the you know the hustle and bustle. That's something that I really liked. So I thought I'll apply, and I got in. So yeah, and I don't regret my three years. I really enjoyed it at Manchester. As to why I'm still here. <laughs> Hugh, what, what drew you to Manchester? Because you I like the course, came. so I did economics at Manchester quite a long time ago now. Uh, but I chose it because it was a relatively small course, so it's, now it's called the BSc in Economics, and it has about um, somewhere between 70 and 100 students per year. So you got to know everyone, and it allowed me to focus on the elements of economics that I was most interested in, and Manchester was a really good place for it. So they're the reasons why I chose, uh, chose my course, because it's the size, the teaching style, and the options I was able to pick, so they're the kind of things I was looking for at least. So we've got a couple of questions queued up, but I thought just after you'd spoken a little bit about the open day, whether you'd be able to say what an open day is like and whether people need to sign up or apply to them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, you need to sign up for the open day and they are the best opportunity to get a feel for what the university is like. So the next one's on the 22nd and the 29th of June and we have more in September and October as well, so you're welcome to go on to either. If you want to sign up for ones in June, you'll be able to do that from April onwards, so uh, towards the end of April you'll be able to sign up. And basically what you'll do is you'll go to uh, a load of different talks about the subjects that you're interested in. So even if you're not quite sure what subject you want to do, you can go to a talk that is focused on that area. So that means if you're still deciding between stuff, it's a good way to kind of put your foot in the water and kind of see what the academics are presenting and you can decide which one is the better fit for you. That's the thing you should prioritise first of all. There are also loads of stands across the whole campus and therefore there will be admission staff, students on those courses, academics, and you can ask them and have a conversation with them. Get the stuff that you really want to know. So you'll get the presentation giving you the good overview, but it's good to have a bit of a conversation about like, what did you like about that course and what were you involved in and what kind of stuff can I do and can I study abroad and what kind of work placements can I do and all that kind of stuff. Um, do plan ahead. So what you'll do is when you're able to book on, you'll be able to download the, um, the Open Day app and that will allow you to kind of plan your day. We don't ticket any of the talks, so it's kind of first come, first serve, but at least you can kind of plan out when you want to get to stuff during the day because it's um, a really easy campus to get around. Everything's about a five or ten minute walk from each other, but because there's so much stuff you could potentially do, you want to make sure that you prioritise your subject talks, get to the stands to speak to staff there as well, and then go to any of the other things like our accommodation talks, um, maybe do a campus tour, mm -hmm. lots of things you can kind of um, do. Yeah, there's ambassadors that you can speak to, so you know, people who are similar, they might be in the first year of university, so you can say to them, you know, are you enjoying it? What, how, even application advice, maybe they have some tips that they can give you. But it's a great way to familiarise yourself with the campus, to see what it is like when it's busy, when the students are in, when it's term time. And, I mean, if you come in June, hopefully the sun's shining, so <laughs> you make a nice day of it. The famously great Manchester weather. Yes. Um, one thing I'll buy <laughs> tip for the open days, don't wear purple, because we want oh, to yeah. make sure that you can speak to as many students as possible. Any of the ambassadors that you'll see will be wearing purple hoodies or purple vests. So feel free to ask anyone you see purple any questions, and you might want to avoid that if you're making any fashion choices in the morning. Yeah. I think you asked for this one, Isabella. Is it always raining in Manchester? <laughs> 
no. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know what percentage it rains out of the year. Less than Leeds. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, you'll... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe it's, isn't it less than uh, the national average? It is less than the national average. Yeah. Well, there you go then. If you invest in a good umbrella... Well, my mum always says, if it's not the weather, it's the clothing that you wear. So if you buy appropriate clothing, you buy a waterproof rain jacket, then... Man. <laughs> such a mank mum. Then, <laughs> then it's fine. Get an umbrella and you'll be fine in Nanda. But yeah. Brilliant. Uh, so somebody else has asked, how much revision did you do leading up to your A-level exams? And then I guess we could tie that in as well with like, what's the step up difficult to uni study as well? So I'll say, so I'll have an example. So I studied psychology as one of my A-levels and I did quite bad in one of my mocks. And I think that was a turning point for me because I realised, so I had a conditional offer, so I knew that I had to get specific grades to get onto the English course that I wanted to at the university. So that kind of made me think like I really need to focus now. So I didn't spend all my time revising, I just made sure that I prioritised my time. So I, you know, because I made sure that I studied enough but also wasn't putting too much pressure on myself. So in the end I did end up getting the, the right grade to go to the university. So it does pay off and in terms of the step up, so you, you go from studying three A levels to or maybe B techs to then study in just one course, but you have different modules, so you have different academics who can help you out. So you don't just have three teachers, you have like a few. So it is a big step up. It's, you know, I won't lie about it, but the support's there, your academic support, your friends that you make, they're all going through the same thing. So just be prepared for a step up, but don't make it put you off or don't feel nervous about it because there's so much support at the university. And like I said, other people in your course will feel like the same. So you can talk about people, talk to people about it as well. Completely. The only thing I'll add to that is speak, get help early. You are not yeah. the only person in a situation that might feel like I don't know what's going on or I feel like I'm falling behind. Speak to your academics, speak to your tutors and do it early because that means that things aren't going to build up. You won't fall behind in things. We want to help, but if we don't really need that help, then we can't offer it. So, as I said, don't feel like you're by yourself. You're always with other people, but do it early on in the course. Do it early on in the year so you make sure you can get, make the most of it. Lovely answer. Uh, we've only got a few minutes left, so I'll rattle through the ones that we've got. And if, if you've got any, uh, do pop them in the comments and we'll either answer it in the time that we've got or we'll get back to you afterwards. And you can always drop us a DM as well. The social team will get back to you as quickly as they can. Um, so, first of all, congratulations to Arby, who got accepted for an MBA. So, another one there. Um, are there interviews for every course? No. Uh, that was a, I, I want to take it there, but no, there aren't interviews for every course. Every course is assessing students based on the skills that they need to see. So the majority will be basing a lot on the application, so your personal statements and your predicted grades, that kind of thing. Some courses like healthcare, like nursing, dentistry, midwifery, uh, medicine, they will interview because it's part of what they need to assess. Other courses are a bit of a mix, so uh, business, uh, law, they won't have any interviews, again based on the application. Something like physics will, just because of the nature of the course, there's multiple pathways within it and they want to make sure you're on the right one. So have a look at the course pages and there's an application and selection bit of it. It'll say if there's interviews as part of it and there should be a prompt in UCAS as well, but, but it is only, I'd say probably about a quarter of our courses interview. It used to be more, but it's probably around that proportion now. I would say I think it's like a two-way street, so interviews can be really nerve-wracking, but it's also a way for you to decide if the course is right for you. So I had an interview for my course, and I was nervous, but it was it was almost like an informal chat, and it was with an academic, and you know he was kind of saying, well, what what made you choose this course? Why would you choose English language over English literature? And it kind of helped me to solidify my decision, and also to see whether it was right for me the course. So, yeah, it is nerve-wracking, but it is a two-way street, so it's also for you to clarify whether it is the right decision for you or not. Um, two course-specific ones as well, um, of what is the rate of acceptance for computer science and is the medical school difficult to get into? So we don't advertise typically the entry rates for every course because there's just 400 of them and it gets very complicated. Uh, there are various resources online and UCAS are about to release one in a couple of weeks time that will be able to give you a bit more of that information um, but I don't have the numbers to hand unfortunately. Uh, but you can, you, uh, through UCAS you should be able to find some of that in a few weeks time once they release their new grade and selection tool. Um, 
And is, is it medicine? Oh, medicine. Yeah. It, again, it's very... Uh, I can do one thing at a time, clearly. I can't <laughs> hold, I, I've got a great memory, but only not that professional. Question. We've cracked um, him. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of medicine, again, it's quite a selective process. So in general, we take about... We have about just over 2,000 applications for medicine per year. We interview about 1,200 people for medicine. And then we make probably about 600 or 700 offers. So about a third of people that will apply will get an offer from us. And then we'll accept about somewhere between 370 and 400 students for medicine each year. So there's probably about a one in five chance from applying to actually coming to be a student at Manchester um, because we don't make as many offers. Um, so it is a selective process. You do need to make your application as strong as possible. You need to be able to kind of uh, do well at interview. And I've mentioned previously the non-academic form. So be able to talk about teamwork. Communication skills, uh, resilience, resilience um, ability to talk about work experience and voluntary work and your interactions and the reflections you've had there. They're the kind of things that we're, we're looking for. It's very much a vocation in medicine. So therefore you need to be able to show skills that are more extracurricular. The majority of our courses are focused on the supercurricular, so the subject itself. Whereas medicine wants to see what you are like as a well-rounded person. So that's why we're looking for slightly different things and there are a few more steps to the process. Lovely stuff. I'm going to try and rattle through these as quick as you can because I've just got a couple more. Um, do you know if you're accepted into a university before you receive your A-level results? Uh, no. Um, no. Not at Manchester. Theoretically, at the universities, they could choose to make you an unconditional offer, but this is very rare now. It used to be more of a common thing. Now it's a conditional offer where you'd have to wait to get your results. Lovely. Uh, I applied to e-functional psychology, but I want to study psychology. Um, is there a way I can change it? So contact the admissions team, see what the options are. So contact the admissions team for the course that you're wanting to do, and then we can work out the details from there. Lovely, we're rattling through them now. Uh, do you provide support for assessment centres? Um, in terms of disability assessment, um, yes, if it's, that, if it's that, I hope it is, then we have a disability assessment centre on campus, and our disability advisory and support service will be able to help direct you to that. If you're in a school and college and have support packages in place, then quite often we'll kind of roll that over. But if there's additional uh, support, for example, the DSA, which is what the assessment would usually for, the disabled students allowance to get uh, financial support to kind of provide technology and stuff like that, then uh, DAS, the Disability Advice and Support Service, will help you through that. If you've got any questions about disability support, you can also contact us in advance of applying, and that would be completely separate to your application. So if you just want to know what your experience would be, you're welcome to drop us a line, and it's just DAS, D-A-S-S, at manchester.ac.uk. I guess there's a slim chance that Adam might be a current student asking about assessment centres and careers as well, and if that's the case, oh, yes. the careers service or if you drop them an email, they they have things like that. I'm yes, pretty yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, that's right. So they help with psychometric tests, they help with assessment centres, they help with mock interviews. Just pop in or drop them a line and get the help from them. Lovely stuff. So I'm going to come with our final question before you know I, I say thank you very much and gushing, gushing words. <laughs> um, but is it mandatory to do A levels to enter the university? Absolutely not. I mean, they probably give you the most flexibility, but in terms of we accept it as the most popular popular combination of qualifications is A level. However, we accept a variety of other things, so B techs, T levels. It very much depends on the course that you're applying to. So if you've got a combination of subjects, um, that is generally fine, generally okay. Um, if you if you just if you're just doing an extended diploma for B techs, it will kind of depend a little bit more about the course and whether we have any particular subject requirements. But please don't feel that just because you're not doing an A level means that we don't want you to come to Manchester. Do have a look at the course profile, do have a look at what we need. The reason that we have certain subjects and certain qualifications is that we don't want to get someone in the course who hasn't been taught something that, in, that we're going to be teaching, what we expect them to know that we're teaching them. We don't want to set people up to fail. So that's the reason why we have particular subject requirements. So hopefully that won't be the case for most of our subjects, but do have a look for the individual degrees you're applying for, but don't feel put off, do have a look. And if you have any questions about it, again, drop us an email because we'll be able to explain what that means for you. So before you both get laryngitis from talking too much, uh, I'm more <laughs> well, before we go, do you both want to sum up separately Manchester in three words? Put you right on the Why spot there, aren't I? I'm trying to think of the best words because I don't want someone to sell it. Not that it needs selling. Um, <laughs> Diverse, friendly, lively. They're my three words. That is good. Yeah, I, I'm going to steal diverse. Because I agree, that's something that stood out to me straight away, the, the diverse range of people from different backgrounds, different, different countries, and the, you know, the academics, so not just your friends, the people who are teaching you, they're from all different parts of the world. So definitely diverse. 
I would say opportunities. It's not really an adjective, but it's something that you get from the university. So, so many opportunities and I guess memories. So you're going to build loads of memories from the university. All good oh, ones. Very good. <laughs> Lovely last word. Yes, very well played. Uh, there's the occasional question coming through now, but we are going to call that the end of it. So if you want to drop us a DM, if you have any more questions, that's perfectly fine. And our, our team will get back to you as quickly as they can. But thank you very much, Isabella. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks for all the good questions. And thank you, everyone.